to global Africa and reparatory justice. So what we saw emerging then was a classic circumstance where a people in one place were expressing a body of opinion and in another place, their governments were contradicting them. Thus, we saw the evolution of the citizen versus state paradigm. The citizens of Africa versus the states of Africa. The people and their governments are not seeing the future in the same way. So many of us walked away from the government forum and went across to join our brothers and sisters in the NGO forum and realize that the governments were not speaking for us. Our arguments in the NGO forum was that reparations is about accountability. And this was an argument we felt had to be made not only for our own context of Africans, but this is a posture to be adopted for humanity on the whole, that all peoples, all governments, institutions that commit crimes against humanity must be held accountable. Whether they be our governments or their governments, all governments, irrespective of their ideological and political positions, must be held accountable for crimes committed against the people. And this would be not only to the benefit of Africans in the first instance, but humanity as a whole, as a posture for the 21st century. The Europeans had argued that they could not commit to a reparatory justice conversation, largely because, in their judgments, the Africans were not deserving of reparations. And you must understand, if you, the Africans had been commodified for 400 years, they were treated as property, uh, a value system was surrounded the Africans, Africans were seen a certain way, not yet ready and deserving as a people for reparatory justice an expression of a continuing diminished concept of the African value as a people. Now, how do we reconstruct? It is clear from the history that every generation of African peoples everywhere in the last 400 years at one moment or another, had demanded reparatory justice. It is not a contemporary phenomenon. All generations had demanded it. Indeed, the emancipation legislations that were passed in the 19th century, in each instance, the liberated Africans demanded reparations. It was a 19th century concept. It was clear Africans had always demanded reparatory justice. But in every instance, the Africans were defeated. As you know, in the European emancipation legislation, the slave owners received reparations. They rejected the notion that the enslaved were entitled to reparations and instead paid reparations to the enslavers. So reparations has been at the center of Pan-Africanism from the very beginning. It is not new. It is not it is not a 21st century concept which is evolve, evolving within Pan-Africanism. It had always been at the core, but had always been defeated. And why is that? It is because, in my judgment, weak and disorganized, uncommitted communities have never received reparations. Reparations is a process that is arrived at by the powerful, the organized, and the committed. We have not reached that stage as yet. Pan-Africanism 
has not reached that stage as yet. But what we do know is that the contemporary forms of atonement without reparations, those contemporary forms of atonement which we see in the world today, in the post-colonial world today, these notions of atonement, of truth and justice without reparations are not coherent philosophical views. They are really, in fact, concessions to power. They are, in fact, no more than a concession to power, but lacking internal philosophical coherence. Pan-Africanism in this 21st century has to reinvent itself around the global reparatory justice movement. It is only such a movement, it is only such a movement that can rekindle the dignity, the historic energy, and the future purpose of the African peoples. Even the Americans knew when they won their war of independence, they fought a bloody war against Britain, they won their independence, and they sought to build a new nation upon slavery. The result of that was the Americans had to go back to the battlefield a hundred years later to resolve that matter. Do we have to go back to the battlefield and post-colonialism to resolve this matter of reparatory justice? There can be no sustainable development without land. There can be no progressive development without the just redistribution of wealth and the confrontation of structures of wealth that were built upon criminal accumulation. <laughs> Reparations and the reparatory justice movement is progressive. It is humanist. It is non-racial. It is non-sexist. It is a call for accountability. I have no doubt, looking through the lens of history, that you cannot build a modern nation upon the proliferation of ghettos. I felt very proud of the Jamaican Prime Minister a few weeks ago when as the first post-colonial prime minister, the first prime minister born in the nation state, took a very different view. And the massacre conducted against the Rastafarian community in the year of independence, in the year of national independence, the new national government committed atrocities upon the Rastafarian community, behaving in many ways like the colonial state. The colonial state and the new national state had assumed almost identical identities. I'm finishing. <laughs> and the Prime Minister of Jamaica not only apologized to the Rastafarian community, but the state has offered to pay reparations to those people. The Prime Minister's argument is that while we commit to global reparations, we must first put our house in order. The question I ask then in this lecture 
to all of us Pan-Africanists, is this not the time? I thank you. No, uh, no, thank you very much, Sir Hillary, for that uh, uh, lecture. It was quite uh, excellent. As you have uh, seen by the responses, uh, what the gentleman was, was saying was that uh, forward with your ideas in Isizulu. <laughs> so Pambili means forward. We have... Um, a uh, time now for, for questions. I'm sure many of you have uh, questions. Uh, so we'll, we'll, we'll take the first round. Please, it is not rational to say that which you can say in one minute, in 10 minutes. So let us keep it uh, uh, short. Uh, number one. And then we remind the world, all pirates, yes, they rob I. Sold I to the merchant ships. And minute after, they took I. But our heads were made strong by the hands of the great creator. And we forward, even in this generation, triumphantly. Elder Beckles, again, we triumph because you stand in response to our cry. And I remember, because I was a witness and I was part of the team that had to go from government to NGO, when Sidney Bartlett, David Comision, Elder Thompson looked at each other in disbelief that Nigeria and Kenya and South Africa stood there and voted against what we asked for and I was asked to go to NGO and that day was the hardest part of my life having assimilated as a South African and I denounced my naturalization and took back my Jamaican passport immediately and I was unapologetic and until today the South African government continues to ask me when are you coming to collect your ID because I could not understand for all of history and what we've done, sacrificed families, come and repatriated, set up systems and institutions and the people we came amongst told us we really can't be on your side. That was, uh, that was a serious psychological trauma on those of us who witnessed this. But we still forge on because our heads was made strong by Mveling Langi. You know, what I would like to answer is the question of, 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 of what we, where we are at now. And it's that issue of when we left uh, Waka, we said, it will have to be the nation states within South Africa who have to demand repatriation, not only from South Africa's repatriation movement, but from owning up the repatriation. So here's where the sadness come. Six weeks ago, I was called to Cape Town. A woman who came to South Africa in, by the Rastafarian community in 1987 to head up the matriarchy of the Rastafari movement was told in February of this year she would be deported. She's 76 years old. I called on the government of South Africa and I said, don't do this. Mama B set up homes. She built communities. I got a thousand affidavits. Today, the South African government, because I couldn't go to the High Commission of Jamaica to ask them to agitate, they tried to advise us what would the best route would be. But this is an, in, a case in point happening right now where Jamaicans, people from Barbados, people from the Caribbean are still not given the right. But the good news, Ghana, in January, gave 42 states, uh, 42 repatriates 
their citizenship and the right of return. The president, the Nkrumah legacy, lived in Ghana in January this year. And we have to find ways to use those examples to create it. So I want to ask you, uh, Elder, Elder Beckles, can't say, sir, um, when, when are we going to now give precedence to those of us living in the continent who have assimilated the right to push you know, because we have not found the synergy. And how are we going to do this? And we beg of you to guide us on this. We give thanks. Yeah. Very much, Sahila. I'm partly covered by the first question. But I, I seek to indulge you on, on, on issues of leadership to take not just this project, but I believe it's a program because it would be multifaceted in nature. Feldsman, in his book, Leadership, um, he then says that uh, reality is an interconnected whole of reciprocally influencing interacting variables. In other words, it, it, it's more complex than, than most people think. Now, now, given the leadership of Africa that we see today and, and the diaspora, what do you think the program of action should be? Emphasizing leadership, you know, as, as very critical in taking us forward. What, what, what do you think uh, should the beginning and the end be, the whole program, uh, so that all of us should participate? Thanks. So, shall I say it now, or is he going to read? Yeah. I'm Pearl Robinson from uh, Tufts University, American in Africa. Uh, this, this split between the NGO and government fora, the thing that I have, I continue to wonder about, and I'm a political scientist, why are we locating Pan-Africanism in the NGO forum and saying that the governments, that, that Pan-Africanism can't also be located in the government for it. If we are, to the extent that you've got people in countries that are democracies, and if you're talking about accountability, doesn't there need to be done some political work with the NGO people on their governments so that it's not when you show up at the international forum that the government says we dissociate ourselves from people, the people, the NGO people. So I'm just sort of wondering if maybe you have some advice about how some more serious work of accountability can be done by citizens who are operating in the NGO forum to hold their governments accountable and you know what their position is supposed to be before they show up. Good morning. Okay, my name is Makosi from Kuluman. Uh, I've got quite few questions, but before I ask my question, I want to say that Soweto, uh, during the times of apartheid, it had about 88,000 people. And in those 88,000 people, when reparation was considered in South Africa, only 22,000 stories were taken and they were closed. Up among that, 16,000 of those only got the TRR number. And there were many promises that were made and all those things. But what I would like to know that, and what uh, Kulumani has done then, has tried to argue with the state to ensure that they keep up the promise that they have made. 
I'm sure some of you know that there is money in the government, in the president state, in the presidency, where it was allocated for the TRC and so forth. I would not dwell into that. But what I would like to know is because the cases uh, that Kulumani has opened, it had went into international level, where uh, we sort of argued with the industries that sort of contributed to apartheid, such as uh, Mercedes-Benz and um, Ford and so forth. But when we were in a close line where it was, when now the case was supposed to be closed and gave a final judgment, the USA made another policy, a policy that made, uh, made the organization not have the power to argue the issues of TRC, which then was then led to the South African government, which was the one that's supposed to take the case and further continue with it because it has been dealt with. So this year, in, June, in, de in December, it's going to be 20 years of those promises. But what I want to find out or an advice maybe what we can do, because people that deserve these uh, reparations are dying. Some of them did. Um, OK. <laughs> so OK, how do we get rid of the elephant in the house when it's issues of this justice? Thank you. Thank you. 